Good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to introduce you to Professor Ian Bryden from the University of Edinburgh's School of Science and Engineering. Professor Bryden gained, gained his PhD in the dynamics of flexible floating of wave power energy devices and has over 30 years' experience of marine energy and tidal currents. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Institute of Marine Engineers, <coughs> Scientists and Technologists, and the Institute of Physics. Professor Bryden leads the Institute of Energy Systems at Edinburgh University. The Institute is made up of five integrated research areas. Marine energy, power systems, energy and climate, machine and power electronics, and innovation and policy. The Institute was formed in 2002 by bringing together colleagues in wave power and energy systems and operates extensively throughout the UK and Europe. The wave power group created the initial Salter's duck, which generates electricity from wave power. Since then, Professor Bryden's team in Aberdeen have developed a generating machine called the snail, which could be the first tidal power solution to be widely adopted worldwide for commercial electricity production. I would now like to hand over to <coughs> Professor Bryden. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I've been told not to move from this spot, otherwise you won't hear me. So if, uh, I'll, I'll look to these gentlemen here to shuffle me about if the, uh, the volume goes down. What I, I want to, to talk about really is, I would say, the, the last 30 years of marine energy. And uh, I'm not going to look 30 years into the future, but I'll uh, try and look perhaps eight years into the future. It's as far as anybody... Uh, sane and sensible ever wants to look. I'll also bring your attention in my opening slide just to a, a, a non-university logo in the bottom left-hand side, European Marine Energy Centre. This is a unique venture here in Scotland which really uh, hammers home the fact that Scotland is the world leading location for the development of wave and tidal current power and I'll say a little bit more about that perhaps in a, a few minutes or so. But anybody who's uh, used to working with the sea will know that it's uh, a very fascinating but very dangerous place. The bottom right-hand side shows photographs that I actually took of Yesnaby Head um, in uh, the mainland of Orkney about 10 years ago now. Uh, there's quite a bit of camera shake there, and that was terror, believe me. Uh, it, uh, I, may, I may have... Uh, I have uh, worked offshore, I may have worked on survey boats, but those wear waves still scared me. Um, I'm not actually allowed to use the word that I used the last time I showed that slide. Um, the top image shows the more or less the same location, but uh, in perhaps a, a more uh, uh, manageable zone. This is scary stuff, but why are we even interested in it? Um, we do feel that we've got a resource which we can exploit, uh, that it's going to be carbon free. It's out of phase with the wind. Everybody who looks at renewable energy, um, perhaps with a touch of scepticism, always points to wind turbines not turning when there's no wind. Well, we tend to get waves when there isn't any wind. There's a, a good 12 hours, maybe even 24 hours phase difference between the wind and the waves. That can prove very, very useful. And of course, the tides are unaffected by the weather. We've got two resources here that are out of phase, and they're considerably more reliable than uh, the, the, the local wind resource. We've not now got devices in the water. We've not identified any significant environmental consequences from extracting energy from either the waves or tidal currents. And we really do believe that we are developing a new marine industry here in the UK, and Scotland in particular. So it would start 30 years ago. Before the 1970s, there was uh, lots of uh, fairly eccentric rambling. I've pulled in a couple of images from the, the late uh, 19th century taken associated with patents, both North American, for wave power devices. Uh, there was nothing really serious happened until the 1970s. When the UK government, which at the time was worried about interruptions of petroleum supplies from the Middle East, 
funded what looks now to be a very ambitious and rather pie-in-the-sky research programme. Uh, the aim was to develop a three gigawatt wave power station by 1980. Even now, we're not talking about three gigawatt uh, wave power stations. However, it was an important era for us. The principles of testing of technology in a controlled environment were established during that uh, period. And we saw some prototypes emerge, notably the, the Japanese device, Kaimi, which was the world's first serious wave power device. 70s started in Europe as well as Japan and really simultaneously started in three locations. Here in Edinburgh, Professor Stephen Salter, now retired, was one of the, the three pillars of the European wave uh, sector at the time. In Lisbon, Antonio Falcao, still active, as is uh, Stephen. And in Trondheim, Johannes Fulness. All three of them are formally retired. All three of them are probably still turning in 60-hour weeks. Uh, devoted to the development of uh, renewable energy. It, it's, very, it's possible to superficially look at this and say, right, okay, there's been a steady development from the 1970s. Uh, you know, from this era here, 1974, there's Stephen pointing to an early wave power device. But it's been a bit rocky at times. Again, there we have the same image. Look at the date, October 1974. Uh, the laboratories had been built, and that's them in use establishing the principles of test. In uh, 1978, the top right-hand side, the old wide wave tank, which was uh, adjacent to the James Clark Maxwell building at King's Buildings, was the world's first dedicated test facility for wave power technology capable of simulating random waves in three dimensions, effectively capable of creating a model ocean, statistically. And it's... Uh, not just the universities this was going on, bottom right-hand side was designed from the National Engineering Laboratory in, uh, in East Kilbride. They had their own devices. There were many devices proposed here in the 1970s. Now, the great uh, uh, steps forward that were carried on, you would have thought we would have had wave power by now. However, it came to an end on the 19th of uh, March, 1982, 2.30 uh, in the afternoon. Uh, when Mrs Thatcher said, no more, we're going nuclear. And uh, I remember that date and that time because I was uh, at my halfway phase in my PhD and I had my halfway progress meeting with my thesis advisor, advisory team. And the first question, I, I didn't know this decision had been made at the time, was, uh, well, it's all over now, what are you going to do? What are you going to finish your thesis on? Um, and I carried on. I'd gone too far to change the, the topic. However, it wasn't uh, a complete end. A good friend and colleague of mine, uh, uh, Trevor Whitaker at Queen's Belfast, in good Ulster tradition, said that he wasn't going to stop. And uh, he carried on. He raised funds, scrabbled together <laughs> funds. And he almost single-handedly kept the development of wave power going throughout the the, the, the 1980s, just by sheer determination. So much so that he actually installed the UK's first wave power device in 1990, the 75 kilowatt device on Isla. And many of us kept going, but without funding, just, uh, just keeping the, the principles going. Move forward into the 1990s. We started to see renewed funding coming through, mainly from the European Union, it has to be said. And uh, Trevor's device, top right-hand side, was really tested to death, more or less. This was the only wave power device operational in the UK. Everybody wanted to get their hands on it. But it wasn't just wave. Another significant uh, personality appeared, Peter Frankel, then from IT Power Limited. He tested the device in the bottom right-hand side in uh, Loch Linney in the west coast of Scotland. This was the world's first serious testing of a tidal current energy device as opposed to a, a wave device. And we started once again to get the, the excitement of uh, the development of a new technology emerging. Move into the last decade. Seems strange saying the last decade now. But more formal funding started to appear. More formal funding for research and development, also to support the development of devices 
the government was finally prepared to discuss revenue support, how to actually pay for the electricity from these uh, devices. We also built the European Marine Energy Centre, so I'll spend about five minutes talking about that. And crucially, we started to see commercial scale prototype testing. Last decade was very exciting, this one's going to be even more so. In Edinburgh, we built new facilities. Our old, beloved wide wave tank had been demolished to make way for a new building. We were only given permission for five years, we kept it for uh, nearly 20. Um, and we, we built this facility in the bottom right-hand side. This is our present facility, the curved wave tank. There's Stephen again, uh, somewhat greyer than he was in the earlier photograph. Most of our wave power work now goes on in this tank. It's much smaller than our own one, but it's very much more capable than the, uh, the original wide tank. So what are we actually working on? I don't just mean here in Edinburgh, but across the, the wave power research community. There's the big questions about the resource. Can we actually get the energy out of the, the wave and tides? Well, yes, we can, but can we do it safely, sustainably, and the big question, economically? Any monkey can get energy out of the waves and tides. The challenge is to get it out for a price that people are willing to pay. Once we've made that deduction, what are the real limits? How much can we actually extract? Are we going to be providing 1% of the country's electricity or 100%? Big questions. And then associated with that, where should we actually be looking at it? Top right-hand side shows... Uh, uh, a distribution of tidal currents. You see the red blob at the top of the Scottish mainland there. We'll have a look at that later. The bottom right shows uh, the distribution of wave energy around Europe. The numbers are kilowatt, kilowatts per metre of wavefront averaged over the, the year. Off the west coast of Scotland, the average influx of wave energy off the west coast of Scotland is of the order of 70 kilowatts per metre. So if you're... Uh, 100 metres wide, you can start getting an idea of uh, the potential for energy extraction off the, the Scottish coastline. What else? Measurement. You'd think we'd been measuring waves and tides for years. This is still right at the limit of uh, what we can do to measure the form of these waves and tides. How do we describe the resource in a manner that is suitable for the engineers who are designing the technology to use? And of course, the machines themselves. Even now, we're still working on optimising how to moor the technology, how to hold it in place. How do we store the energy? How do we distribute the energy? These are still questions. We've still not got an industry as such. Once we've answered these questions, then we, can, then we have. Right, some of the questions on the, the wave resource. The North Atlantic does a really good job at collecting wind energy for us. Collects it, concentrates it, stores it, and then hurls it in our direction so that we can utilise it. This is just a, an example of a developing storm off the, the coastline of Orkney. A predicted developing storm. The prediction made with input from the Met Office. We can predict wave conditions anything up to 10 days in advance. That's very important if you're from the electricity supply industry. What we do know is that we've got a huge resource and we can largely forecast it with a great degree of accuracy. Tidal resource. The British Isles are situated between two massive tide generating systems in the North Atlantic and the, the North Sea. This has given us some of the most extreme tidal elevations and extreme tidal currents in the world. Top right hand side is a computer animation of the, the tides progressing around Scotland. Even just looking at that, you can see pinch points at which you would expect accelerated currents. We've been looking at these in considerable depth, as indicated by the, the results from uh, some of the, the more detailed models. Bottom left hand side, of course, is the Pentland Firth. Pentland Firth is one of the three most energetic stretches of water in the world not just in terms of waves, uh, but also in terms of currents. I used to live in Orkney. It's an absolute pig of a stretch of water. I believe that anybody who seriously talks about wave and tidal current power in the Pentland Fast should be forced to do, as I've done, spend significant periods of time 
in that stretch of water in a 35-foot survey boat. If they're still interested after that, then perhaps I'm prepared to, to listen to them. But we can't ignore the Pentland Firth at all. The devices. There's, somebody told me just last week that something like 480 patents for wave power devices. <coughs> However, we believe that all of these uh, fall into one of six types. Uh, which I've given you here. I'm not going to spend any great time looking at them, but these are really what we talk about as the fundamental device concepts for wave technology. I've yet to see a wave power device that doesn't fit into one of these categories, or well, a sensible wave power device that doesn't fit into one of these categories. Similarly with Tidal, there's probably four concepts. Uh, Top left hand side, very similar in concept to a, a wind turbine, just a horizontal axis turbine. Bottom right hand side, the vertical axis turbine, a bit like the Darius or Savonius turbines that you sometimes see. And two rather more bizarre systems, devices based on the Venturi effect in the top right hand side, and these things a bit like a, a whale's tail, the oscillating hydrofoil on the, the bottom left hand side. I refer to these as the, the fundamental device concepts, and uh, uh, the challenge is making these things actually work. And work they do. Here's some of the full-scale prototypes that are already in the sea. This uh, beast has been in place since uh, November 2000, almost 11 years now. Limpet, uh, relatively small, 500 kilowatt device on the, the coast of Isla. Lots of people have photographs like the Bottom left-hand side, I'm very proud to have taken the photo on the bottom right-hand side. You don't see those ones quite so often. This is Palamis. This is the Palamis P1, developed by uh, Palamis Wave Power here in Edinburgh. It had its birth in our wave tanks uh, many years ago. It's, uh, it's a bit like a snake. Well, that's what Palamis means. It uh, extracts power by utilizing the, 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 the motion of this flexible snake. And it's uh, interesting, the bottom right-hand side, you can see the construction of the power unit. That is in a subsea fabrication facility. This technology draws upon proven subsystems coming primarily from oil and gas. And that's an important feature of the successful wave power devices. This plan is installed, again, P1. That's a good few years ago now, off the west coast of Orkney. You can hardly see it. So for anybody that thinks that these things are going to spoil our seascapes, um, uh, that was taken from a helicopter. You couldn't even see the blasted thing from the shoreline, which is a real pain in the neck for us who are trying to monitor its performance. Go to tidal. Bottom left-hand side, we see the first very significant tidal current device that was installed in the Bristol Channel. Uh, nearly 10 years ago now, called Seaflow, a company called Marine Current uh, Turbines Limited. It's, uh, that's it in its maintenance position. Bottom right-hand side, you see the next generation system, CGEN, which is currently generating electricity in Strangford Loch in Northern Ireland. I do spend quite a lot of my time uh, flying back and forward between Edinburgh and, uh, uh, and Strangford to, uh, to discuss with the developers of this system and the operators of it how they're going to move the technology forward. That thing is rated at 1.2 gigawatts. So far, it has generated more marine renewable energy than any other device, apart from, of course, the Laurent's tidal barrage in northern France, which has been operating since 67. This is a different type of technology. OK, if you're going to develop a technology like this, Obviously, you can't do it from uh, a, a position of uncertainty. You have to understand all the design stages and you have to understand the relationships between these design stages. You need to be able to assess at the prototype stage. Once you've got your designs in place, assess how they operate, whether they operate according to your criteria, and therefore to feed back into the design process. This is the role of EMEC, the European Marine Energy Centre, and similar centres in Portugal in I and Ireland. When I talk to my, uh, my colleagues, we tend to talk about the closure of the design, development and deployment loop in this. What about EMEC? Here is where it is. 
in Orkney, off the north coast of the Scottish mainland, and there are two principal sites on Orkney, just, in the, just off Stromness on the uh, side of the, the West Mainland, you'll see a little diamond, that's the wave test centre, and off the island of Ede, you'll see that there's a, a, a red uh, triangle, which is the, the tidal test centre. EMEC operates as a private limited company. However, its startup funding was almost entirely public. And you see this, the, the list of the principal funders, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Scottish Government, Department of Energy and Climate Change, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna go, try to go through them all because I always miss something out. And there's always somebody in the audience who from the organization that uh, I've missed out and they get upset about it. So we'll move on. 2003, the wave site opened. We have four cables, approximately two kilometres long, out to 50 metres water depth, and into which we can install prototype, prototype device, bring the electricity to the substation, the bottom right-hand side, for export into the, the local grid. It's not just the power, of course, these cables are carrying fibre optic links, and virtually everything that we could imagine is being monitored on these devices. We've now installed one new cable and another shallow water berth, which uh, uh, has just come online the last year or so. Move forward, 2007, the tidal site uh, opened. This is right out in the North Isles. We have, uh, initially, we had uh, five berths in a range of water depths, each one in a slightly different flow condition, so that we could test a range of different technology concepts. And, as indicated by this, we've uh, monitored these flow conditions, probably the most studied stretch of water in the world. We know more about this, uh, these tidal channels and the wave region than anybody else does about any other stretch of water worldwide. Okay, let's step back to the, the wave site and the, uh, the cables come in at this cove, referred to as Billia Crew. That was the Oyster 1 device that was tested extensively, has now been removed and has been replaced with this, the Oyster 2 device. Another Edinburgh-based company, Aquamarine, uh, OPT device will be going in on one of the outer boys. Palamis P2, the second generation Palamis, is in the process of installation and there'll be two batches of them going in for testing. And uh, this device is due to go in early next year. It's called the Penguin. Uh, it's, it's one of the most difficult devices to actually appreciate uh, how, it's, how it behaves. It is a, actually an example of a floating buoy device, but it looks more like a sort of an asymmetric, badly designed ship. Go to the tidal site. That's the open hydro system. That's been in place for some years now. Uh, they've had two devices. Uh, a surface piercing device and a completely submerged device. That's the TGL device that has been in, taken out, and has now been replaced again. Um, that uh, is the Atlantis device that was installed, taken out, and has now been replaced by its successor device. Um, I've forgotten which one that was. I should know. I'll remember at the end of the talk. <laughs> And we have a, a whole series of devices, the Scott Renewable device developed by a local Orkney company in the bottom uh, right-hand side uh, will be the last of this uh, batch to go in. Currently four, in fact five of these berths are now occupied by equipment. The tidal site is essentially full. So the decision was made last year to expand EMEC, and this is more just to give you an idea of the the operations that EMEC has to go through. Every cable we put in costs us of the order of a million pounds. So it's not a trivial exercise. These are quite significant marine operations. Um, we've had one of them sever severed by an anchor cable already. That was not a happy day. So, as of now, we now have uh, five testing cables. We've added an additional wave, device, wave cable in, in the wave site, and we've added an additional two tidal cables. That's confirmed as of about uh, two weeks ago that these cables are now fully operational. We're also in the process of uh, building smaller sites. It's a costly operation going to these full-scale sites, believe me. 
And uh, many developers want to test things out at a quarter scale rather than full scale. So we've now implemented two new sites, a wave site in the top right-hand side and a tidal site in the bottom right-hand side. These are all equipped with moorings, with instrumentation, but crucially, no power cable. We're not expecting to export power from these tidal sites. And these, are, these form a bridge to full-scale deployment because previously it was a £10 million job if you wanted to put a full-scale device. I mean, in the, the total development and installation cost. Developers can go to these sites at a much earlier stage of their uh, business plan. But it's not all at sea. We still do work in tanks. There's our tank, built in 2001, still very, very, very busy. Come back in two years' time, life will be a bit different. There's the architect's sketch of our new test facility. It's called the, the UK All Waters Current and Wave Test Facility. And uh, that's a, a rather more detailed image of what this is going to, to look like. This tank is 30 metres in diameter. It's completely circular. It's five metres deep. We have 168 wave makers. We have 28 two metre diameter impellers so that we can have waves and currents. We'll be able to do testing at one-tenth scale under the same kind of robust conditions that we were able to test at one-fiftieth or one-hundredth scale. Another bridge to deployment. EMEC have built a quarter-scale bridge. We have a tenth-scale bridge. So if you come back in two years' time, I'll be able to show you this, uh, this operating. At the moment, unfortunately, I can only show you a few images. This is, I suppose, the marine geek speak, but uh, the, the important figure is the one at the top. We will be able to perform physical simulations of wave and tidal conditions in all UK waters. We'll be able to simulate the Pentland Firth, we'll be able to simulate the Bristol Channel, anywhere that anybody in their wildest dreams would ever consider putting wave and tidal technology. So look forward, beyond two years. EMEC is still talking about expansion. Off the west coast of, uh, southwest coast of England, off uh, Cornwall, we now have Wave Hub. Think of Wave Hub as being a big socket in the seabed into which a wave power developer can come and plug their technology to export their energy. It's not a test centre like EMEC. This is for early commercial development of wave energy. It's now international. We're seeing development across the world involving partnerships with the UK. Ireland, obviously, we work very close with our Irish friends and colleagues. But other countries, Korea, Canada, South Africa, USA, Taiwan, China, are all developing a marine sector. And they're all drawing upon expertise from, uh, from the UK. Closer to home, of course, the Scottish Government has announced the uh, £10 million Salter, Salt, Salter? Saltire Prize. This is intended to target commercially viable wave or tidal technology. The prize is set at 100 gigawatt hours generated over a two-year period. I think if I was a betting man, I know who I would put my money on at the moment, but I'm not going to tell you because I don't want the odds to fall. And this is uh, coincident with the, the fact that the Crown Estates have now uh, granted 1.8 gigawatts of leases in and around Orkney for both wave and tidal. Every one of these areas has now been allocated. So it's going to be a very exciting few years. £10 million sounds an awful lot. I reckon you would probably have to invest about uh, £30 million to get that £10 million prize. So it's, that's not the purpose. It's a focus. It's a statement of significance. These were predictions made by our policy and innovation unit as to how this 
sector is going to grow over the, the next year. Uh, to a certain extent, it's an a issue of faith. The government has set targets of two gigawatts of installed wave and tidal current technology by 2020. A key figure from this uh, prediction is that it means that we've got to double the installed capacity every 12 months. We've actually kept that rate of doubling over the past three years, starting from a very, very low base. And the, the, the granted leases and activity over the next two years says that we don't see any deviation from that doubling. But what this is also suggesting is that by 2016 or so, the unit cost of wave and tidal energy should start to undercut onshore wind. It actually has to if these predictions are going to work. And of course, if this prediction is correct, 2019 is going to be an unbelievably busy year. We've got a gigawatt of installed capacity in 2019 if these targets are going to be reached. I'm not taking any bets on whether we're going to reach that target. It's a target. Okay. A few years ago, I could stand up and say that we had a vision for wave power. And there it is along the top. Computer generated images of sea gen, palamis and oyster. What we've now got are machines in the water either generating or have generated electricity into grids. That grew from research in university laboratories. We've actually seen a developing industry that's come from universities originally. It has to go beyond the universities, however, and that's where we are now. But of course, every time we put uh, a few hundred tons of steel in the sea, we learn something new that we didn't know before. So we're generating new challenges. So there's still the involvement for the universities in the sector. You see, at the bottom there, uh, we do know a huge amount more than we did two years ago. But uh, we've discovered a lot more that we, we didn't know. A few years ago, I put a 100 kilowatt device in the sea. It was called the snail at the time. I reckon in the 15 minutes of the installation process, I learned more about how the sea behaved than I had in the 20 years previously. Everybody who's involved in this sector is experiencing moments like that. It's exciting, but it's scary, and it's certainly not something to be done lightly. Thank you. Thanks, Ian, for a very important okay. presentation. Does anybody have any questions for Ian? Okay. The, there's been quite significant studies on both of these, and uh, much of the work that's ongoing at EMEC by EMEC, the EMEC research staff is, is to judge that very, very issue. I can probably summarise what the two <coughs> biggest worries are. Uh, in wave power, it's the fact that wave energy devices selectively extract energy from small waves, not the big waves, for their own survival. The big waves pass over them. Uh, you don't want to absorb the energy from uh, a 30 metre high wave. Um, so, but you, so you take a larger proportion of energy out of, the, say, the one, two, three metre waves. This actually produces a, a, can produce a measurable change in the on offshore drift of sediment. So there is a concern with wave power that you might change the sediment drift. That could have an ecological consequence. Uh, you probably wouldn't be able to visually identify a change in the wave climate behind a large wave farm, but there could be a measurable change of sediment. That's being monitored at EMEC. For tidal, the, the biggest worry uh, there has been direct impact with the blades. And uh, the experience with CGEN and with the, uh, the, the devices at EMEC is that the, the, the species that concern the most, the whales, dolphins, porpoises, seals, uh, tend to avoid the, the technology. 
uh, there's been no recorded impact between a cetacean or a seal in Strangford Lock with a CGEN device in two years, despite the, the degree of monitoring. There is video images of seals and dolphins coming and looking at it and swimming round it, but not actually going through the, the turbine. So, so far, all the indications are that these, the technologies appear to be benign. I think there's a design issue, however, design of both the technology and the, the, the developments. Um, it would be possible to design a wave, a wave farm that would be detrimental if you put it in the wrong place. Just as I think it's possible for uh, a tidal current device to be designed that would pose an impact hazard if you were uh, uh, careless, let's say, with the, uh, the, the hydromechanics of your design. Um, however, the sector so far has been characterised by very responsible development and the, the, the principal tidal technology that worries me the most has been always been rejected when licences have been granted. Um, I, it's, it's devices that artificially accelerate the flow, the, the venturi primarily. Animals could get caught in that and so far no licence has ever been granted and probably never will in the UK waters. That's the, the yes. Yeah. Current, yeah. The there was a study done by Cowrie, um, primarily for both the oil industry and the electricity distribution industry, uh, to look primarily on electric fields mm -hmm. from uh, seabed mounted equipment, not for marine renewables. And they looked at that very very image, and there's quite a large bank of information on that and that information is all being used by the, the marine sector to attempt to minimise impact. It doesn't matter how you generate electricity, you always make an environmental impact. There's always a value judgement to be made um, and nobody in this sector is kidding themselves. I mean when we start putting uh, half gigawatt wave or tidal farms uh, we will get objections just like the wind sector has encountered. But the, the, so far the onus has been on the developers to be very responsible with their proposals. Every device that has gone in the water so far has been monitored to death, monitored to, death to make sure that um, uh, we, we don't uh, make any uh, significant uh, detrimental changes. And every one of the developers has had to sign a condition that if their device proves to be detrimental that they will remove it and none of them have had to yet. Any other questions? You mentioned damage from the Atlantic. Is that uh, the kind of what occurs, or is there a... Is it, <laughs> it was particularly annoying. It was... Uh, one of the developers was putting their device uh, on e one of the EMEC berths, and uh, they used an anchor handling vessel and they dragged the anchor, they dragged, they themselves dragged the anchor across one of our cables and they, they had to replace it. Um, it, it was an example of, uh, it, was, it, it was a bit of uh, procedural error on their part, so it was a one-off device. Nobody in their right mind would have been trying to anchor a vessel in a tidal channel of that form, unless of course they were putting a tidal device in place. Is that the point? The point is that you, you put these devices in areas that are, are normally where shipping lanes and things like that. You'd be surprised. I mean, the, the, the fall of Warness, where the, the, the tidal site is in EMEC, is used quite heavily. Yeah. And the, uh, it has set a condition on the location of the, the technology. The, 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 um, the, the top reach of the blades um, has to... Has a, we have a a minimum distance between that and the lowest astronomic tide so that um, any uh, anticipated registered vessel would be able to pass over it with a considerable safety margin. So we can't fill the water column with Submarine turbines. Activity. Sorry? Submarine uh, nobody would ever take a submarine through the fall of Warness. Uh, not when you've got uh, the potential of uh, five metres per second currents. It would be the last thing they ever did. <laughs> Other questions? 
time when all wage generating machines will look the same like wind turbines. So do you think it will always be that there's going to be a, a range of machines? This is a big question, of course, in the, the sector. Um, no, I don't. Uh, we will get convergence, and we're getting convergence already. I mean, all wind turbines look the same. You can't tell Avestus from anybody else's. Um, we'll not get that. What we are likely to get is uh, convergence for different conditions. So I, I suspect we'll see convergence for deep water, convergence for um, inshore, and convergence for coastal mounting. For tidal, uh, I think we're actually seeing convergence. You saw those images of the tidal prototypes. They all look the same. They all had three blades, horizontal axis with the exception of one floating one. And it's because uh, every tidal device that has been put in at significant scale that has not followed that profile has underperformed quite drastically. So elements of convergence, but nothing like as uh, total as we've had with, uh, with onshore wind. Any other questions? The TGL device, which has just been installed in, in EMEC, is designed for a 25-year lifetime. The MCT device in Strangford was designed for 15 years, um, but they themselves are expecting their next device, the so-called uh, CGNU, to be designed for, for 25. Um, that's with, with maintenance, obviously. It's not, they're not being maintenance-free in that time, and maintenance is an issue in these environments. Wave power devices, I think 15 years is probably more realistic, but uh, most of the developers are <coughs> aiming at 25 years, but uh, I, I think 15 years makes me a little bit more comfortable. The extreme forces that wave power devices have to put up with, obviously. Anybody else? Conscious of maybe some of the rest of the on behalf of the association, okay. I'd like to present to you oh, with right. an appreciation for his very informative yeah. talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.